One of heliocentrists' favorite supposed proofs of their ball earth theory is the ability for ships and planes to circumnavigate, to sail or fly at right angles to the North Pole, and eventually return to their original location. Since the North Pole and Antarctica are covered in ice and guarded no-fly zones, however, no ships or planes have ever been known to circumnavigate the Earth in north-south directions, only east-west. And herein lies the rub. East- or westbound circumnavigation can just as easily be performed on a flat plane as it can on a globular sphere. Just as a compass can place its center point on a flat piece of paper and trace a circle either way around the pole, so can a ship or plane circumnavigate a flat earth. The only kind of circumnavigation which could not happen on a flat earth is north-south bound, which is likely the very reason for the heavily enforced flight restrictions. Flight restrictions originating from none other than the United Nations, the same United Nations which haughtily uses the flat earth map as its official logo and flag. David Wardlaw Scott says, Circular sailing no more proves the world to be a globe than an equilateral triangle. The sailing round the world would of course take very much longer, but in principle it is exactly the same as that of the yachtsmen circumnavigating the Isle of Wight. Let me give a simple illustration. A boy wants to sail his iron toy boat by a magnet, so he gets a basin, in the middle of which he places a soap dish or anything else which he may think suitable to represent the earth, and then fills the basin with water to display the sea. He puts his boat and draws it by the magnet round his little world, but the boat never passes over the rim to sail under the basin, as if that were globular, instead of being simply circular. So is it in this world of ours. From the extreme south we can sail from east to west or from west to east around it, but we cannot sail from north to south or from south to north, for we cannot break through intervening lands nor pass the impenetrable ramparts of ice and rocks which enclose the great southern circumference. Samuel Robotham says, a very good illustration of the circumnavigation of a plane will be seen by taking a round table and fixing a pin in the center to represent the magnetic pole. To this central pin attach a string drawn out to any distance towards the edge of the table. This string may represent the meridian of Greenwich extending due north and south. If now a pencil or other object is placed across or at right angles to the string, at any distance between the center and the circumference of the table, it will represent a vessel standing due east and west. Now move the pencil and the string together in either direction, and it will be seen that by keeping the vessel or pencil square to the string, it must of necessity describe a circle round the magnetic center and return to the starting point in the opposite direction to that in which it first sailed. So the ball earther's logical argument is that only a globe can be circumnavigated, the earth has been circumnavigated, and therefore the earth is a globe. This is indeed a logical modus ponens statement, but the conclusion is rendered invalid because the first premise, that only a globe can be circumnavigated, is categorically false. Another similarly logical but unsound argument ball earthers make is that only on a globe would one gain or lose time when sailing or flying east or west, Time is gained or lost when sailing or flying east to west, and therefore the earth is a globe. Again, the logical conclusion is rendered invalid and the argument unsound because the first premise is incorrect. The same effect would be experienced on a stationary flat earth as it would on a spinning ball earth. William Carpenter says, The sun, as he travels round over the surface of the earth, brings noon to all places on the successive meridians which he crosses. His journey being made in a westerly direction, places east of the sun's positions have had their noon, whilst places to the west of the sun's position have still yet to get it. Therefore, if we travel easterly, we arrive at those parts of the earth where time is more advanced. The watch in our pocket has to be put on, or we may be said to gain time. If, on the other hand, we travel westerly, we arrive at places where it is still morning, the watch has to be put back, and it may be said that we lose time. But if we travel easterly so as to cross the 180th meridian, there is a loss there of a day, which will neutralize the gain of a whole circumnavigation. 
and if we travel westerly and cross the same meridian, we experience the gain of a day, which will compensate for the loss during a complete circumnavigation in that direction. The fact of losing or gaining time in sailing round the world, then instead of being evidence of the Earth's rotundity as it is imagined to be, is in its practical exemplification an everlasting proof that the Earth is not a globe. Another favorite supposed proof of ball earthers is the appearance from an observer on shore of ships' hulls being obfuscated by the water and disappearing from view when sailing away towards the horizon. Their claim is that ships' hulls disappear before their mastheads because the ship is beginning its declination around the convex curvature of the ball earth. Once again, however, their hasty conclusion is drawn from a faulty premise, namely that only on a ball earth can this phenomenon occur. The fact of the matter is that the law of perspective on plane surfaces dictates and necessitates the exact same occurrence. For example, a girl wearing a dress walking away towards the horizon will appear to sink into the earth the farther away she walks. Her feet will disappear from view first, and the distance between the ground and the bottom of her dress will gradually diminish until, after about a half a mile, it seems like her dress is touching the ground as she walks on invisible legs. The same happens with cars speeding away, the axles gradually getting lower and the wheels vanish until it appears as if the car is gliding along its body. Such is the case on plain surfaces. The lowest parts of objects receding from a given point of observation necessarily disappear before the highest. David Wardlaw Scott says, This law of perspective meets us on every hand and cannot be gainsaid. If, in a straight line, we look at a frozen lake from a certain distance, we shall observe people who appear to be skating on their knees, but if we approach sufficiently near, we shall see them performing graceful motions on their feet. Farther, if we look through a straight tunnel, we shall notice that the roof and the roadway below converge to a point of light at the end. It is the same law which makes the hills sink to the horizon as the observer recedes, which explains how the ship's hull disappears in the offing. I would also remark that when the sea is undisturbed by waves, the hull can be restored to sight by the aid of a good telescope long after it has disappeared from the naked eye thus proving that the ship had not gone down behind the watery hill of a convex globe, but is still sailing on the level of a plain sea. Not only is the disappearance of ships' hulls explained by the law of perspective, it is proven undeniably true with the aid of a good telescope. If you watch a ship sailing away into the horizon with the naked eye until its hull has completely disappeared from view under the supposed curvature of the earth, then look through a telescope you will notice the entire ship quickly zooms back into view, hull and all, proving that the disappearance was caused by the law of perspective and not by a wall of curved water. Samuel Robotham says, On any frozen lake or canal, notably on the Bedford Canal, in the country of Cambridge, in winter and on a clear day, skaters may be observed several miles away, seeming to glide upon limbs without feet skates and boots quite invisible to the unaided eye, but distinctly visible through a good telescope. But even on the sea, when the water is very calm, if a vessel is observed until it is just hull down, a powerful telescope turned upon it will restore the hull to sight, from which it must be concluded that the lower part of a receding ship disappears through the influence of perspective and not from sinking behind the summit of a convex surface. Ball earthers will often also quip that if the earth were flat, then we could see all over it. But this is, of course, ignorant and inaccurate. If you stand on the beach, a plain, or prairie, you will find the horizon extends about three to six miles around you, depending on the weather and your eyesight. The range of the human eye, our field of vision, is from 110 to 1 degree and the smallest angle under which an object can still be seen is one sixtieth of one degree, so that when an object is three thousand times its own diameter away from an observer, it will cease to be visible. So for example, the farthest distance at which one can see a one inch diameter penny is three thousand inches, or two hundred and fifty feet. Therefore, if a ship's hull is ten feet above the water, it will disappear from the unaided eye at 3,000 times 10 feet, or 6 miles. 
This has nothing to do with the supposed convexity or curvature of the Earth, and everything to do with the common law of perspective. Thomas Winship says, The horizon of an observer is distant or near according to the greatness or otherwise of his elevation above the surface of the supposed globe. If he stands 24 feet above sea level, he is said to be in the center of a circle which bounds his vision, the radius of which in any direction on a clear day is six miles. A local gentleman tells me that he has watched a boat race in New Zealand, seeing the boats all the way out and home, the distance being nine miles from where he was standing on the beach. I have seen the hull of a steamer with the naked eye at an elevation of not more than 24 feet, at a distance of 12 miles, and in taking observations along the South African coast, have sometimes had a horizon of at least 20 miles at an elevation of 20 feet only. The distance of the horizon, or vanishing point, where the sky appears to touch the earth and sea, is determined largely by the weather, and, when that is clear, by the power of our vision. This is proved by the fact that the telescope will increase the distance of the horizon very greatly and bring objects into view which are entirely beyond the range of vision of the unaided eye. But as no telescope can pierce a segment of water, the legitimate conclusion we are forced to arrive at is that the surface of water is level, and that therefore the shape of the world cannot be globular, and on such a flat or level surface, the greater the elevation of the observer, the longer will his range of vision be, and thus the farther he can see. Samuel Robotham says, On the shore near Waterloo, a few miles to the north of Liverpool, a good telescope was fixed, at an elevation of six feet above the water, it was directed to a large steamer just leaving the River Mercy and sailing out to Dublin. Gradually the masthead of the receding vessel came nearer to the horizon until at length, after more than four hours had elapsed, it disappeared. The ordinary rate of sailing of the Dublin steamers was fully eight miles an hour, so that the vessel would be at least thirty-two miles distant when the masthead came to the horizon. The six feet of elevation of the telescope would require three miles to be deducted for convexity, which would leave 29 miles, the square of which, multiplied by eight inches, gives 560 feet, deducting 80 feet for the height of the main mast, and we find that, according to the doctrine of rotundity, the masthead of the outward-bound steamer should have been 480 feet below the horizon. Many other experiments of this kind have been made upon seagoing steamers, and always with results entirely incompatible with the theory that the Earth is a globe. In the mid-nineteenth century, a Frenchman named Léon Foucault became famous for swinging pendulums and claiming their consequent motions were proof of the Earth's diurnal rotation. Since then, Foucault pendulums have regularly been swinging at museums and exposition halls worldwide, purporting to provide everlasting perpetual proof of the heliocentric spinning ball earth theory. The truth is, however, unbeknownst to most of the duped public, that Foucault's pendulum is a failed experiment which proves nothing but how easy it is for pseudoscience to deceive the malleable masses. Lady Blunt says, This pendulum, modern scientists tell us, affords a visible proof that we are living on a whirling globe, which, according to a work on science, now before me, is spinning upon its so-called axis at the rate of over a thousand miles an hour at the equator, and in addition to other motions is rushing on an everlasting tour around the sun, the diameter of which is said to be 813,000 miles, and its weight 354,936 times greater than the Earth, from which it is said to be about 93 million miles distant, at the rate of over a thousand miles per minute. Now to prove that the Earth really has these motions, a pendulum is suspended at the show. The showman sets motion and bids the gaping world of thoughtless men and women to behold a proof that we are living on a whirling globe which is rushing away through space. William Carpenter says, Astronomers have made experiments with pendulums which have been suspended from the interior of high buildings and have exulted over the idea of being able to prove the rotation of the earth on its axis by the varying direction taken by the pendulum over a prepared table underneath, asserting that the table moved round under the pendulum instead of the pendulum shifting and oscillating in different directions over the table. But, since it has been found that, as often as not, the pendulum went round the wrong way for the rotation theory, 
Chagrin has taken place of exaltation, and we have a proof of the failure of astronomers in their efforts to substantiate their theory. So to begin with, Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise, and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate, and sometimes they rotate far too much. Scientists who have repeated variations of the experiment have conceded time and again that, quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. The behavior of the pendulum actually depends on, one, the initial force beginning its swing, and two, the ball and socket joint used which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the Earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum's swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. If Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360-degree uniform diurnal rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. Samuel Robotham says, First, when a pendulum constructed according to the plan of Mr. Foucault is allowed to vibrate, its plane of vibration is often variable, not always. The variation, when it does occur, is not uniform, is not always the same in the same place, nor always the same either in its rate or velocity or in its direction. It cannot therefore be taken as evidence, for that which is inconstant cannot be used in favor of or against any given proposition. It therefore is not evidence and proves nothing. Secondly, if the plane of vibration is observed to change, where is the connection between such change and the supposed motion of the earth? What principle of reasoning guides the experimenter to the conclusion that it is the earth which moves underneath the pendulum and not the pendulum which moves over the earth? What logical right or necessity forces one conclusion in preference to the other? Thirdly, why was not the peculiar arrangement of the point of suspension of the pendulum specially considered in regards to its possible influence upon the plane of oscillation? Was it not known, or was it overlooked, or was it in the climax of theoretical revelry ignored that a ball and socket joint is one which facilitates circular motion more readily than any other? Lady Blunt says, we believe, with all due deference to the pendulum and its proprietor, that it proves nothing but the craftiness of the inventor, and we can only describe the show and showman as deceptions. A thing so childish as this pendulum proof that it can only be described as one of the most simple and ridiculous attempts to gull the public that has ever been conceived. It has been said that the pendulum experiment proves the rotation of the earth, but this is quite impossible, for one pendulum turns one way, and sometimes another pendulum turns in the opposite direction. Now we ask, does the earth rotate in opposite directions at different places at one and the same time? We should like to know. Perhaps the experimenters will kindly enlighten us on this point. If the Earth had the terrible motions attributed to it, there would be some sensible effects of such motions. But we neither feel the motion, see it, nor hear it. And how people can stand watching the pendulum vibrate and think that they are seeing a proof of the motions of the Earth almost passes comprehension. They are, however, brought up to believe it, and it is thought to be scientific to believe what the astronomers teach. Also in the mid-19th century, another Frenchman named Gaspard Gustave Coriolis performed several experiments showing the effect of kinetic energy on rotating systems, which have ever since become mythologized as proof of the heliocentric theory. The Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's pendulums spinning either which way, sinks and toilets in the northern and southern hemisphere do not constantly spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin in opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the earth. Jennifer Horton wrote, while the premise makes sense that the Earth's eastward spin would cause the water in a toilet bowl to spin as well, in reality, the force and speed at which the water enters and leaves the receptacle is much too great to be influenced by something as minuscule as a single 360-degree turn over the span of a day. When all is said and done, the Coriolis effect plays no larger a role in toilet flushes than it does in the revolution of CDs in your stereo. 
The things that really determine the direction in which water leaves your toilet or sink are the shape of the bowl and the angle at which the liquid initially enters the bowl. The Coriolis effect is also said to affect bullet trajectories and weather patterns as well, supposedly causing most storms in the northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise and most storms in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise, to cause bullets from long-range guns to tend towards the right of the target in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Again, however, the same problems remain. Not every bullet and not every storm consistently displays the behavior and therefore cannot reasonably be used as proof of anything. What about the precision of the sight aperture, human error, and wind? What about Mickelson, Morley, and Gale's proven motion of the ether's potential effect? Why does the Coriolis effect affect most storms but not all? If some storms rotate clockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south, how do those storms escape the Coriolis force? And if the entire Earth's spin is uniform, why should the two hemispheres be affected any differently? Coriolis's effect and Foucault's pendulum are both said to prove the Earth moves beneath our feet, but in reality only prove how easy it can be for wolves in sheep's clothing to pull the wool over our eyes.